This is a production of Cornell University. Our topic today is actually around what a practitioner needs to understand with regard to field safety. And there's a number of aspects to it that I want to just highlight. To really give this subject a solid treatment, I'd have to spend a lot more time uh, on each individual aspect. But I want to give you an overview of the kinds of things you need to think of and just really go for the low hanging fruit. If, you, if, you don't, if you're having a hard time getting your arms around what is field safety, by the time I'm done, you should at least have a good understanding of the things you need to have on hand to make sure you're going to be successful should this ever come into question for you. Now, when you think about the intricacies of field safety, there's two components to it, right? You can have field hardness that you're likely to fall on and get hurt, or you can have high traction, which oftentimes leads to what we call non-contact injuries, and you can get knee and ankle injury. So we're talking about hardness that causing con con concussions and fractures, and tractions that are knee and ankle injuries. And of course, what I've done here is look around the particular issue and say, what are the, thing, what are the aspects of that hardness that involve the soil and the grass? What are the aspects of that traction that involve the soil and the grass? And then, you know, the non-contact football injury risk is one of the things that we constantly will come back to. So, we're worried about risk from a perspective of hardness and traction, and for the purposes of my time with you today, I'm strictly going to talk about surface hardness, but I want you to understand that there is a very sophisticated aspect of safety with regard to traction. Now, in New York State, we have a law now that has been passed to protect uh, athletes at the scholastic level from da further damages from concussion. There, the law, the Concussion Management and Awareness Act, has now put into place a series of uh, steps and methods and procedures and diagnoses, education plans, that then govern how, when an, a concussion is suspected, how it's diagnosed, what kinds of treatments are provided, how long you have to be away from the sport. This has become a very, very, very important aspect of athletics at the scholastic level. And what's been fascinating to me is in this entire act that I've read at length, there's virtually nothing about field safety. There's nothing about field hardness. It's really all about sort of determining was a concussion happening and um, you know what do you do with the athlete. Nothing about was it caused by some sort of malfeasance on the field. So, I'm drawing your attention to this particular act because I think it's not going to be long that there's an aspect of this act that's going to impact the way we manage our field. So just like the Child Safe Playing Field Act that is governing whether we can use pesticides or not, uh, that we can't use pesticides on school grounds, this Concussion Management Act right now, it does not have strict legislation regarding field management, but it could eventually. Now, there's a number of papers that have looked at field in, uh, injury associated with the field. It's typically done by medical professionals, sports medicine doctors, uh, sort of epidemiologists, people who study sort of spread of disease and injury and things like that. And a lot of times it's related to surveillance systems. Uh, NCAA or high school athletics has an injury surveillance system that they look for where the injuries occurred. Now the other aspect of this that's very important is the field quality. And oftentimes there's a disconnect between the injuries that are reported and the quality of the field. Now this particular study published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2004 looked at 250 games over a five year period in high school sports. They looked at natural turf, which they didn't characterize the quality of that natural turf, and field turf, which is a, um, a particular brand of synthetic infilled turf where you have the fibers and the rubber. Now I don't know that anything is specific and there's some sort of controversy between the field turf people and this study, 
But for now, it's a good indication. I use this because it's a good indication of the things that actually will and could happen. Now you have total injuries, injury rate per team game. You've got substantial injury and severe injury. So substantial injury is you miss a couple of games. Severe injury is you miss months, maybe even the whole season. Now if you look at the differences between a natural turf system and a synthetic turf system, the first thing you'll notice is that the synthetic turf system has a higher percentage of total injuries occurring on synthetic turf. However, when you look a little more closely, you see that the severe injury ratings on natural turf is much higher than it is on synthetic turf. So while you get more common injuries on field turf, and they're primarily epidermal rashes, rug burns, and some muscle strains. The concussions, as we indicated a minute ago, uh, is what we are focusing on here in New York, and maybe field hardness, is much more common on natural turf. Now here's where the tricky part comes. It's entirely possible that these fields were in terrible shape. Because one of the things we know is if you've got grass, you're likely to have a more cushioned surface. So there could be these fields that they're playing on may have a significant amount of bare ground exposed, which could lead to these concussions. So, so just so that you wonder, oh, you know, do I have to worry about one surface or the other? From a safety perspective, they eat, each surface has their concerns, the concussions on the natural field, and the epidermal abrasions on the field turf. Now, why would you, well, it's just a rug burn. Why is that a problem? Well, the rug burn is, in fact, a serious wound where blood vessels can be exposed, and athletes that then go into sweaty whirlpools or sweaty weight rooms or, or go back into the locker room and start touching things with an open wound, the potential for MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, this sort of lethal fatal disease that can happen to people that can, they can contract in those situations is very common where you get a lot of these rug burns. So basically the solution to that is not to spray the field with disinfectant because that's not the issue. The issue is to treat the wound, keep it clean. Hygiene is the primary way you avoid any further problems from, from this. So just an overview of, because you get a lot of questions about natural synthetic. It's an overview of this issue. OK, so let's look a little bit on synthetic turf safety. If we're just honing in on synthetic turf, because I'm going to spend most of my time talking about natural turf, but I want to make a point here on synthetic turf. There's two additional health concerns on synthetic turf you need to be aware of. One is that there's been a long time concern about the presence of chemicals in these products lead in the paint that they're making, lead in the plastic that the synthetic turf is made out of, and also contaminants in the rubber that makes up the infill. But the fact is the body of research done shows, done with this, and, and a lot of it was done by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, has done a thorough review of this, and you can go to the DEC website and see that re report, which is you know, mostly very in-depth, deep, dense science that I barely have, can understand. But the, the conclusion was that there's minimal health effects related to the chemicals used in the synthetic turf process. But the other one that's real is the heat. On an 80 to 85 degree bright sunny day, temperatures on the synthetic turf system reached between 120 and 146. To put this in perspective, you can fry an egg at 152. So this kind of safety is a serious problem. Imagine you're playing on a summer day on a synthetic turf field and someone gets injured and then has to lay on that field waiting for assistance. About five or 10 minutes on a surface that's 140 degrees will create first and second degree burns of the skin if their skin exposed. So you want to be very careful. And generally what we say is, Synthetic turf in northern climates is ideal for the shoulders of the season. The, the spring sports and the late fall sports are good to play on these systems when the grass is no longer growing. But when the grass starts growing in the summer months and you know the heat is building on there, you best stay off of them because water uh, will decrease the temperature but temperature increased back up to 90 to 120 within 30 minutes. So the heat is a serious concern with synthetic turf. Now, when we're talking about hardness, and we're going to talk a lot about hardness um, of these systems, you have to understand the way we look at this. Basically, if you look at this as a head, when it's dropped, okay, if the surface is, is hard 
and not sort of receiving of the, of, the, of the weight, the energy, the downward energy, is then reverberated back into the head, and this is where the damage can occur. However, when you have a softer surface, right, and you drop your head or fall on the surface, the energy in that dropping is dispersed into the turf rather than back into the head that leads to the concussion. So this is an example of how a ground could cause a concussion. Now we have very particular ways and standardized methods, ASTM standards, for how field hardness or surface hardness is assessed. Now this was started many, many years ago in the 80s. There was some research at Michigan State that looked at how to determine field hardness and they borrowed some technology from the pavement industry to see how firm the pavement is. They used to drop a specified weight down from a known height and measure hardness and then they adapted, turf scientists adapted that particular um, method of measuring surface hardness into turf which has then led to the F355 standard and the F1936 standard um, that basically tells you if you're going to measure surface hardness, this is the way you have to do You have to have a consistent way of doing it so that w the measurements all mean the same. And then we ultimately report it, and you'll hear it oftentimes referred to as GMAX testing. Now, GMAX testing assesses the risk of life-threatening head injuries. It does not assess the risk of bone or joint injuries, which could occur, but right now we're focusing on head injuries. And so impact testing as a concept is a weight is dropped onto the surface and the shock of the impact is measured as negative accel acceleration. So you drop the hammer down this tube. This is a very sophisticated GMAX device, 20 grand for something like this. You drop it and following the method and then the rate at which it decelerates or stops is an indication of how the energy is transferred back into the head or the hammer and then that is reported as gravities. And the G-max is maximum deceleration. The higher the value, the harder the surface. Now there's two ways of doing this. The Clegg hammer was the original way that was designed by the turf scientist to sort of look at field hardness. Now what's not been well established in this country, and I'll, I'll show you some data from Australia in a minute, is can you correlate the drop of this particular device to the risk of head injury. Now a different device, the G-Max testing that follows the F1936 uses a 20 pound weight which may be more simulating what a head would do um, and the, the shape of it is concave like that. Um, so the, the, the Clegg is for the natural turf but not well correlated. You can't substitute this for the G-Max and there's some sense of there are people that are trying to do it but you have to be very careful. So here's the two devices that they use to measure this. Now, again, this is only an accepted method for synthetic turf. And here's the setup. This is the $20,000 setup that you get where you lift the hammer and then the reason this is an accepted method is it tells you did you drop the hammer right? Is it moving at the right speed? There's a number of quality controls that this system does that you can't with the simpler Clegg hammer that I'll show you in a second. 20 pound missile drop from two feet, you drop it three times and the second two readings are average. So the very specific way that field hardness is tested. Now if you have a synthetic turf, how often should you test it? Now first of all, when you buy a synthetic turf and it's new, you want to do it and establish a baseline because if the contractor leaves the site and leaves you with a field that is already too high and unsafe, you have no recourse. So make sure, first of all, you get it in the spec that the field has to be built so that when a GMAX test is done at the end, it reads a number this or lower. All right, so for, certainly to establish a baseline and also to make sure you got what you paid for. And then annually thereafter on heavily used fields. So you say, well, heavily used fields? Wait a minute, I got synthetic turf. Yeah, 
Synthetic turf wears out, the infill moves. For those of you that play lacrosse on the synthetic turf, you know that the goal mouth is constantly having the rubber pushed away and the fibers degraded, and you'll often and almost always get a much higher reading by the goal mouth than you will away from the goal mouth because the rubber compacts or wears away and therefore the surface becomes harder. So annually on heavy use fields, and then if you have reports of a serious head injury and the field is implicated, go you know, immediately find someone in the private sector, and there's a number of people, particularly Dr. Hummel at Hummel and Company, that can go and do this GMAX testing for you to create a body of evidence that you may need in a legal case. Now, let's talk about natural turf. No one would argue, certainly, being on natural turf uh, on a summer day would be preferable, uh, but a, certainly a well-maintained grass field uh, can be safe, or a well-maintained synthetic field can be safe. If you're going to maintain a cool season turf field, and you're worried about liability and risk management as a school board member in a local community here, I, I am concerned about that. One place to start is that there is an ASTM standard for maintaining cool season turf on athletic fields. It's uh, F2060. And this is a document you should have, you should understand, you should have a basic knowledge of you know, what's in here and am I following and doing my due diligence. So this is number one, something you should have. And also in a more plain English approach to what's involved in a safe field that you might give to coaches and players and community members, administrators, is something that the sports turf managers have developed, a foundation for safer athletic fields, has a whole four or five page, very in plain English, natural grass athletic fields for safety, and I have the website there, but you can go to stma.org and access this document. Now when you get involved in the legal end of this process, you have to sort of learn some jargon. And one of the most important parts, uh, words and jargon in field safety to see how involved you may be is the duty of care. A duty of care is a legal obligation on an individual organization required that they adhere to a standard of reasonable care. Reasonable care. This would be considered reasonable care. So get this learn this, it's very generic. It ought to be something you can easily commit to doing. Reasonable care or performing any acts that could, be, could foreseeably harm others, right? Are you leaving rocks exposed on the fields? It is the first element that must be established to proceed with action and negligence. So, let's imagine an athlete is using your field and falls and hits their head. And there's no grass there and someone realizes that person's concussed and they are going to seek remediation for the damage that might have been done to that child or adult on that field. The first thing they're going to do when you get a lawyer involved is their negligence. And negligence could then be established if you weren't taking reasonable care. Now, let's look at potential risks. Now this is from um, a Siffers and Beard publication from the late 90s. This is a, one of the foremost turf grass scientists in the United States. Drop the Clegg hammer on a number of different surfaces, all right? Where a cement floor was as much as 1,400 Gs, uh, a, the, a football outdoor four-year artificial, 175. You know, you don't think about this, but in tennis, if you fall and hit your head, that can't be good. Basketball court, that's not going to be good baseball, natural turf, Bermuda grass field. So you can see, very hard to softer. What's not well understood and not well established in this country is what, how does this correlate to head injury? They've got it for the GMAX testing. They don't have it for the Clegg hammer yet. Now as we're talking about legal things, that's the kind of data that a good lawyer is going to start pulling out. And so, as a school district, as a member of a school board, I am constantly mindful of the management of risk in a school district, whether it's how a teacher manages their classroom, it's how, what kind of cleaning products we use to clean the bathrooms, to all the way to how the fields are kept. 
So from a risk management perspective, knowing that field use with that wears out the centers of these fields often, you can see the wearing out here, knowing that that's one of the primary ways the turf gets less safe is, do we have enough space for the amount of use that we have? Is the space appropriate for the type of use? For example, you know, here's a lacrosse field. Are they going to be all right playing lacrosse on a little bit of dirt skin here? Is it appropriate for that use? And is the space managed properly? Do you have enough room? Is it appropriate to play that sport there? And are you managing it properly? So those are the things I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about moving further with regard to this. Now one way to get your arms around this is for communities led by the groundskeeper with a board of education or community sports people to go out and assess the field. Now we developed a tool many, many years ago that's very simple for the average person to fill out. If the grounds manager is there, that grounds manager can answer a question about whether it's the field is watered, how much fertilizer they put on, what the mowing height is, and that's it. Everything else can be answered by a lay person that might use the field. And then you get a number by answering these things. So here is a Hector soccer field where we rated these numbers and it came out with a 31. And we're saying if you get between 21 and 35, you should reassess your management program unless the quality you expect is less than three. But you've got to wonder from a safety perspective whether that field is at risk. So if you're over 35, you've got to think about renovating those fields. If you're under 21, you're doing pretty good. So this, this uh, Travis High School football is obviously doing pretty good. So an easy way to get everybody on the same page and have a conversation about the fields as you're thinking about risk management. Now, no one's going to argue that a grass field is really good when there's grass. But in fact, there's data to support this. It starts out, first of all, by understanding your soil. This is the amount of fine particles. So when you go from here, you're probably talking about a high sand content all the way up to a really clay soil along the bottom here. And this is the hardness of that field. All right? So when you dry that soil down, right, you can see without any grass cover, without any grass cover, as you add more clay particles, if you have a clay soil field without any grass cover, you can see how hard it gets as it dries out the more clay you add. And then, however, when you have 100% grass cover, you can see that the grass mitigates the hardness. So what's the message here? Well, I'm trying to give you really simple things. The simplest thing is if you have a natural grass field, make sure you've got vegetation. I'm going to say vegetation because we think generally broadleaf weeds are not as traffic tolerant. We're still getting some more data. We've had some new data from Tennessee that's indicating they don't hold up as well. They wear out much more quickly. And that's a problem because you want to have a grassed or vegetated surface to mitigate the hardness here, especially for those of you without irrigation as the field's going to dry out more. Now, I spent a little time in Australia this past year and traveled around looking at sports fields and a number of conversations with the grounds industry over there and they actually have guidelines that they've developed from a number of studies conducted in Australia on Australian rules football fields because they play Australian rules football which is this sort of Gaelic football rugby soccer thing it's they play it on a huge field there's 17 guys on a the side they're very no equipment it's shorts and a t-shirt that's it and they've actually developed a system using the CLEG, which we in right now in the States have not adopted. But this is what they have done in Australia, where they're grading it as too low all the way to unsafe. Okay? So it's safe is between 31 and 69. The preferred range is between 70 and 89. Now they're also measuring this 
with related, related to traction as much as field hardness that you could hit your head on. So that's probably why the preferable range is good here and this is considered unsafe because the traction is probably really bad. It's too soft. So you can have a field that's too soft, and you see that with muddy fields, an ideal field, and a field that's too, too hard. All right. Again, we have not adopted this, but these are good values to just sort of start with. Now, if we can agree that grass is good, I mean, just having the so soil covered is good, then we've got to think about how to maintain that cover because overuse will result in failure. So what we want to do, if that fail point is usually, you know, over here, we want to move that fail point further over so that the turf can sustain itself longer. And one of the things we've done with this is some of our work with intense overseeding, where we're overseeding on a weekly basis during the traffic period, light, frequent amounts of seed thrown on a regular basis, to maintain turf cover where normally the traffic would wear out the turf to this. So you're talking about is this safer than this? I can't say specifically, but in general we know the more grass you have, the safer that field's going to be. So here's the study we did. We took this field, we mowed it at three inches. We trafficked the equivalent of five games between the 20 and between the hash marks. So lots of traffic. There was no water. We, watered, we, we fertilized twice a year. We used a drop spreader because the soil is exposed from the traffic. So you, to get good soil seed contact under high traffic, you don't have to slit seed. In fact, several studies have shown slit seeding makes it worse because slit seed starts to dig things up. And then you've got ryegrass, bluegrass, and tall fescue. Now, here's the only two pieces of data that I'm going to show you. We did this over a three-year period. And the rainfall amount in the first year was 20% below normal. So here is the treatment, 2, 4, 8, and, or 10 pounds of seed per thousand. This is turf density, 20% turf density, which means the grass is not very much. 85% means you have a lot more grass. And then in a dry year, weed density, you didn't see a big difference in the amount of weeds that invaded because there was no water for the weeds to grow. We looked at turf quality, which I'm not going to worry about, and we look at Gmax, which I'm not necessarily going to talk about, but essentially you notice as you go from 20% turf cover at 130 Gmax down to 85% turf cover at 55 that the turf gets softer. Now this was true for both perennial ryegrass and for tall fescue. This did not work for Kentucky bluegrass because it takes much longer for the Kentucky bluegrass seed to germinate. So fast germinating plants like perennial rye and tall fescue will work fine. Now the second two years of the study, we did the exact same thing, but we got regular rainfall. Matter of fact, above average rainfall. And what you see is because of the traffic, without any seeding, there's no turf left. Lots of weeds, no turf. Just a little bit of seed, two pounds per thousand per week, gave us 85% gave us 85% turf density and did a really good job of controlling weeds. Turf quality was excellent and field firmness or field hardness was much lower. So when you have, uh, you know, if, you have the, if there's going to be rainfall, you have the ability to irrigate. As little as two pounds of seed can be enough to turn a field from a disaster into a safer field. Because I can tell you, if a kid gets hurt on a field that looks like this, they're going to come after someone for reasonable care. So let's look at this. If you're looking at an American football field, you're looking at between the hash marks and between the 20 yard lines. That's where 80% of the traffic in an American football field occurs between the 20s and between the hash marks. That's your high traffic area. Let's go through the economics. People say, oh my God, throw C every week? How are you going to do that? Well, let's go to the two pound rate per thousand. So let's say we're putting out two pounds per thousand. Assume $1.25 per pound. Some people can get it cheaper. So that's a weekly cost of $2.50 a thousand. That area between the 20s, between the hash, is 16,000 square feet. So assuming these seed rates, cost of seed, weekly cost per thousand, 
multiplied by the area that you're going to treat, it's $40 a week for seed. Let's say you did it 13 weeks in the fall and 13 weeks in the spring. Soccer or football in the fall, lacrosse in the spring, that's 26 weeks. It'd be $1,000 in seed costs. So it's not a burden for most. Even small school districts like mine could afford $1,000 for seed. Now here's an example of a trial we did in the Albany area. Dave Chinnery, our extension faculty in the Capital District, has done a lot of work with this repetitive overseeding. And this is one of his trials where they had played football, played football on it, did the overseeding, and then left it for the next year. They didn't do it again. And you can see in these plots where they overseeded and where they didn't. Where they didn't, this is loaded with crabgrass. And where they did, there's very little weeds growing in there at all. So obviously there can be some weed control associated with that. Now another way to get a safe field, especially if you're you know, really in a pinch and have to get that field in shape really quickly, which what the professional athletes do, and there's a shot at a professional stadium, with the installation of what we call thick cut sod where normally sod would be cut between a half and three quarters of an inch. Here you're talking about an inch and a half to two inches of soil underneath. So it's a very, very heavy sod so that when you lay it, you can play right on it immediately because it won't move. Well, people say, whoa, how can we do that? Well, thick cut sod is roughly 60 cents a square foot. Your goal mouth area that's bare here is roughly 10 by 10. All right, 60 cents a square foot by a 100 square foot gold mouth area, $60. And you could do it a number of times that it's always going to be safe for those athletes there. So many people have started to consider this because we know that having grass is the key, the first step to making that field safer. I'll turn your attention back to this standard that this is the minimum that you should be doing. You've got to get your hands on this and understand what's involved in it. And then simply focus on keeping the use to a level you can manage. And then try innovative things like the regular overseeding to keep that grass in place because that natural turf surface that has the grass on it is always going to be a safer surface in general than bare soil. And then the synthetic and natural turf debate is going to continue with no real clear answers until we get our arms around exactly um, how we can use the Clegg values in natural turf. So I hope I gave you a little bit of an overview of this particular topic. I know you're going to have a, a lot more time to discuss this over the course of the day. And thanks for the time. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.